Good morning, this is Bishop John with a homily from Friar Doc for Ash Wednesday, the beginning of Lent. The Old Testament reading is from the book of Joel, chapter 2, verses 12 through 18. The responsorial verses are from Psalm 51, verses 3 and 4, 5 and 6, 12 and 13, and 14 and 17. And the epistle reading is taken from St. Paul's second epistle to the Corinthians in chapter 5, uh, verses uh, 20, uh, all the way through th chapter 6, verse 2. The gospel reading is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 6, verses 1 through 6, and then 16 through 18. I will discuss them here today, and as always, I urge you to read them when you get a chance. Um, the lessons today, as we begin the season of Lent, deal with forgiveness and reconciliation. Some of us carry the sign of the cross on our foreheads, marked with the ashes of what we waved about in last year's Palm Sunday processions. There can be many signs of our faith and our remorse, but what our Abba really wants from us is our love, our contrition, and a commitment in our hearts to keep our faces turned to Him. The reading from chapter 2 of the book of Joel focuses us on the fact that God will take pity on those of us who are his children and acknowledge him with love. He will help us too, but he can't forgive us and start the ball rolling if we, if we ignore him. When we choose to change our ways, when we turn to him in all humility, he will respond to us exactly as he has responded to his children in the past. Here, God is reaching out to us and pleading with us to change our hearts. Return to me with your whole heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning. Verse 12. Fasting, weeping, and mourning engendered by a broken, sorrowful, and contrite heart are how we gain God's mercy and kindness. Without a humble heart, however, they are nothing but a fraudulent facade, a stage on which to blather and strut, signifying nothing. It is only in our humility that we can honestly reach for our Abba's forgiveness and receive his blessings. Rend your hearts, not your garments, and return to Yahweh. Verse 13. Prophet calls on the priests and the leaders to assemble all the people to offer prayers and sacrifices in the hope that God will revisit them when they repent of their sinfulness and leave behind him and God will leave behind him a blessing because of their offerings and libations. Verse 14. Joel wants everyone involved in this and he wants the sound of trumpets ringing throughout Zion. They are to proclaim a fast and call an assembly. Verse 15. Everyone is to be notified and is to gather for the ceremony of repentance, no matter what they are already doing or what their plans have been. Verse 16. Joel calls on the priests to represent the people and to be advocates for them. The porch of the temple is the outer court, which is the physical visible place of their gathering for prayer, the sign of their faith, and the altar is the spiritual center of the nation where the grace of Yahweh dwells. It is there that true prayers of the people are offered and given to him as gifts from the people. Joel is asking the priests, as they represent the people in worship, to move from the mere appearances of prayers, the physical, to the deep and wrenching reality of faithful and contrite hearts, the spiritual. It looks like this is what they wound up doing. In any case, they are to weep and say, Spare, O Lord, your people, and make not your heritage a reproach with the nations ruling over them. 
Why should they say among the peoples, where is their God? Verse 17. The argument here is interesting. God should spare them because otherwise their enemies will sneer at him and their weakness in the situation would dishonor him. This is more than a little cheeky if you ask me. On the other hand, it must have worked as the addendum states, the Lord was stirred to concern for his land and took pity on his people, verse 18. Or maybe instead it was the sincere remorse and resolve of the people, with the priests weeping with contrition for the nation, for them all, between the porch and the altar, verse 17 again. If we want our Abba to forgive us and scoop us up in his arms, we can't just smile, speak ingratiating words, and have it happen. Jesus commanded us to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength, in verse, uh, Luke uh, 10, 1027, and not merely with words and gestures. This is also the message from the prophet Joel, or Joel ben Bethuel, in the ninth century BC. We don't get our egos out of the way. If we don't get our egos out of the way, the floodgates of God's love for us cannot truly open in our lives because by faking our love, we won't let it happen. The same message essentially comes to us from, uh, from Psalm 51, written in the 11th century BC after David's adultery with Bathsheba that is Uriah the Hittite's wife not the queen of Sheba after uh, okay so may we all learn how to throw ourselves on God's mercy with a profound certainty David shows in the verses from the psalm and with an equally trusting hope that our Abba will reclaim us and make us whole our repentance and his redemption of us are more important than anything else so let's act like we know it and ask for it shall we the verses here are a straightforward plea from one who has known the joy we feel when we are right with god and david seeks once again a, a right relationship with him by the way uh oh god in hebrew for these verses is not the tetragrammaton yahweh but rather elohim or um, Almighty God, the all-powerful, all-knowing creator of the universe, and the author of all justice. The O Lord in the last verse is also not the Tetragrammaton, but instead Adonai in the Hebrew. And, and here the God of mercy is addressed. All sin is effectively committed against our Abba, verse 6, and only he can cleanse our hearts of the stains we have put there ourselves. Only he can keep us steady in our resolve to change our ways, verse 12. Only he forgives our sins with the forgiveness of forgetfulness, verses 3 and 4. Like David, we should cry out with our prayers to stay in his presence and embrace his Holy Spirit, verse 13. We should clamor to be filled with a godly spirit and the joy his salvation brings us, verse 14. Finally, we should be overflowing with a noisy acknowledgement of our redemption by our Abba, verse 17. This must be our prayer for paying attention. We are his children, but our sins separate us from him. The yearning his grace has put in our hearts cannot be stilled unless we once again admit our unworthiness ask his forgiveness and he once again cleanses us and wraps us in his arms this is how we ask for a second chance of course but it is more than that it is how we feel his presence again in our lives and in the world around us it is right for us to cry out together in the words of the first part of verse 3 the responsorial verse be merciful, O Lord, for we have sinned. Paul uh, repeats the theme in the four verses for today from the end of chapter uh, 5 and the beginning of chapter 6 of his 
second epistle to the Corinthians with a further assertion that Christians are agents of Christ. Because of the sacrifice of our Master, we are channels through which God can speak to those around us. Paul makes a simple observation that we are ambassadors of Christ, as if God were appealing through us, and that we can't do the work if we are not ourselves reconciled to God. Verse 5, 20. The incarnation of our Lord was not undertaken for God's sake, but to provide a way for us to return to his perfection. Verse 5, 21. To climb up into our Abba's lap and feel the security of his arms around us. When we sin, however, we break the connection and the deal is off. There's nothing worse than bottling up the grace of God and doing nothing with it to ruin your day. The light to enlighten the nations, our part of it anyway, winds up crammed under a bushel if we do that. And please tell me we're not that stupid. Luke 8:16. Paul ends by asserting that the time for salvation, for our reconciling with God, is now. Not next week. Not next year. Now. He's willing to help the Corinthians succeed. Working together, then, we appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain. Verse 6-1. The last verse quotes the first part of Isaiah 19, uh, 49 8 in an acceptable time I heard you, and on the day of salvation I helped you. Verse 6 2. Paul urges the Corinthians to grab hold of the salvation offered to them and not to put it off. Now is a very acceptable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Verse 6 2 again. Uh, for us, the same urgency applies. If we're serious about this Christianity stuff, we simply can't continue to do what we've been doing as average Joes and Janes and, and expect the reconciliation with our Abba to take place. This is just Einstein's famous definition of insanity, that is, doing what we've done in the past and expecting different results this time. How do you suppose we can do that? Do what we've always done, only harder and smarter this time? Give me a break. I'm reminded of another line here from the great Jewish rabbi Hillel the Elder, written in the first century BC. If not now, when? If not I, who? Do I think the apostles stole the line less than a century later? Perhaps. Maybe not, but as my friend Alan w would comment, I'm just saying. Jesus tells us how to pray and how to be charitable in the verses for today from chapter 6 of the Gospel of Matthew. The Master insists we do it in secret. He tells us not to be public about our fasting, praying, and charity if we seek any reward or approbation in, in, uh, in heaven in verses 1, 2, f uh, 5, and 16. Racking up points with an adoring crowd is hypocritical and a waste of time. Do it in secret instead, verses 3 and 6. Our Abba wants our hearts to be in the right place for all of this. He wants our hearts turned to Him and our minds focused on His kingdom. We can't do it if we focus instead on the magnificence of our carefully constructed facades. It's really debilita debilitating for our egos but our Abba cares about our hearts and not our facades. Verses 17 and 18. Too often we insist on living by the signs of things. Nothing could lead us further astray from the way, the truth, and the life. He asks us instead to go far from the madding crowd, as it were, where the noise and congestion of the world around us interfere a bit less, and where we can focus our prayers a little better. Verse 6. It turns out we can also hear the still small voice of our Abba when he responds to us in such circumstances. In any case, our most effective prayers 
are the ones we offer in secret because we're not thinking about getting brownie points from the folks around us. They come up from our hearts and they have more in common with Jesus' agony in the garden, the first sorrowful mystery of the rosary, than with any common memorized prayer performed for the benefit of other people's eyes and ears. Since human beings are social animals, the point here isn't complete secrecy, but rather that we should pray to please God to relate to Him and not to other people. It is impossible to hide the light of great faith under a bushel. The history of Christianity is littered with examples of saints who started out as hermits but who wound up establishing monasteries and religious orders after groups of disciples flocked to them. St. Paul of Thebes, St. Anthony the Great of the Desert or of the Desert, St. Gerasimus of the Jordan, St. Severinus of Norica, and St. Benedict of Nursia, to name uh, just a few. Our Abba wants nothing more than to welcome us home and to wrap us in his arms. But he can't do it if we defy him, if we refuse to accept the gift of our redemption through his Son, Jesus Christ's incredible sacrifice and marvelous triumph. Although we are monumentally ignorant in our continuing arrogance, he knows we are at least as strong-willed as he. He's given us free will. He's not forcing us. The deal is, we have to want this and we can't hold anything back. We're his children and not his robots. We have to love him to choose him and not ourselves. This business of learning how to trust in Jesus Christ on a continual basis is hard for us. In fact, without the grace of God, it's impossible. We don't have menus or program plans to execute or cross off. We forget all too easily that we should check with him before jumping ahead with what seems right to us. If we truly rend our hearts and not just our clothes, Joel 2.13, our very humility and trust open us to the way, the truth, and the life, and allow us to accept our Abba's mercy and kindness. This is the simple truth presented in all the lessons for today. Lent is an especially important time for us to carve out daily periods for being quiet, for praying, for meditating, for listening for the still small voice of our Abba. It is a time for us to be honest about our shortcomings, to resolve to change our ways, with the grace of God, of course, because, here, let me hear the drum roll, we can't do it on our own and to seek the redemption God offers us because of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. At the same time, we should open our hearts to the Comforter, who is always here, uh, there, and everywhere, to guide, encourage, and heal the holy, common people of God, the Pleb Sancta Dei. It is important to understand this season of Lent for the time of preparation, of reflection, and of prayer, it has to be <coughs> for us to experience fully the deep sorrow and glorious joy of Good Friday and Easter Sunday. They aren't just hypothesized events we accept by faith. They are documented historical facts, documented by unfriendly non-Christians, actually. By all the techniques of evidentiary evidence, the sketches of the various episodes in the ministry of our Lord are overwhelmingly probable. Most, if not all, of the arguments against their veracity require behavior on the part of the apostles, the disciples, and the witnesses that is simply not how human beings act. As we reflect in this time of preparation, we we should remember that the events actually happened. We should remember that real, honest-to-God human beings experienced them. And we should remember that real, honest-to-God human beings wrote the stories of them down for us. Nobody faked anything so they could be martyred the way they were. 
signed this Ash Wednesday with the ashes from the palm fronds of last year's Palm Sunday, some of us. We begin a 40-day Lenten journey today. By the way, this doesn't count the Sundays, as Bishop Jack has noted. It is a trip we have to make with both our hearts and our minds, focusing on our relationship with our Abba and not on the kind of figure we cut with those all about us. Our communal enact, reenactment and remembrance of the death and then the resurrection of our Lord and Master Jesus Christ are already on the horizon. But for now, it is properly a time of quiet contemplation and prayer wherever there are Christians. God bless you and yours.